The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. Therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God by, through faith toward salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Before we open God's word this morning, let's bow our heads together in prayer. Father, we're thankful that you have provided us with your word, that your word is sufficient. Scripture says that you have given us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us uh, through his virtue and glory. And that it is through these that he is, you have given us many precious and magnificent promises. Father, we're thankful for we, the fact that we have your word, that it's alive and powerful, that we are to study it, we are to internalize it, memorize it, apply it consistently, and that it is through your word that we are matured as believers. Now, Father, as we continue our study in Ephesians chapter 4 this morning, we pray that you would help us to uh, recall that which we have learned in these important chapters in Ephesians, as well as to start to put together the significance of what Paul has, has said and is teaching us in this particular chapter. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So let's open your Bibles now to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, and you haven't been there in a while. It's been six months. Just almost to the, to the week, it's been six months. But the other thing that is, that is interesting about it is that um, it's been two years. Almost, and today's the 90th lesson in chapter 4. Of course, part of that, several parts of it, were different topical studies that were important as we came out of this. So it's important to go through these, uh, these passages and to fully understand what, his, what is said uh, in these passages. So what we're looking at this morning is just sort of a review and also an introduction to verses 25 to 28. And I think it's important for me to read these just because we haven't been there in a while and it puts the whole context uh, into our minds. And I think that's important. Uh, this section, I think, ha hangs together with a common, uh, common theme. We started and talked about 25 and 26 when we started off on our topical study on the spiritual skills uh, six months ago, but I'll read from 25 to 32. 25 says, Therefore, and I'm going to correct the translation, having put off the lie, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who steals, steal no longer. A better translation would be, let the thief steal no longer. But rather, let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, 
graciously forgiving one another, even as God in Christ graciously forgave you. This is a this passage begins actually with verse 25 begins a section that extends down through verse 21 uh, with 27 imperative mood verbs plus a number of participles that have an imperatival sense to them so it's a very strong passage describing how we as believers are to live and giving us the boundaries, as it were, for our behavior, not just in terms of, st- of external actions, but also in terms of our, of our mental attitude. And so as we looked at verses 26 and 27, uh, where uh, Paul says, be angry and do not sin, uh, do not let the sun go down on your wrath nor give place to the devil, I paused because we have a, a, this statement, be angry and do not sin. And I talked about what I believe that is saying is that anger is like a number of emotions that something can happen and immediately that emotion presents itself. And we can act on it or not. And that's what Paul is saying here. Um, it's, it, that, that anger wells up just instantly. And he says, don't sin. And I asked the question, how do we not sin? And the answer to that was to look at the various spiritual skills that we have. And anger, I think, is just representative of a whole matrix of mental attitude sins and is in many ways a gateway to these other sins, that if we foster the anger then it can lead to any number of these sins. We have mental attitude sins such as bitterness and jealousy and resentment, uh, thinking vindictive thoughts. It leads to sins of the tongue such as gossip and slander and abusive speech and intimidation or innuendo or emotional abuse. And it can lead to overt sins such as cruelty and physical abuse and violence many, many other sins. And the, the sort of the, what the start of this is getting, uh, getting angry. Scripture tells us that there are three enemies in the spiritual life. These three enemies, first of all, in order of significance, would be the devil. The term devil means someone who is an accuser. He accuses the brethren, Scripture says, but he also is an ultimate source of temptation. He tempts through uh, not always himself because he is not omnipresent, and, but he is present through his minions, the demons, the fallen angels who are uh, going throughout the earth and so when we have passages, I think, like in 1 Peter 5, that the devil goes about like a roaring lion, I think that's talking about him, but it's also talking about um, his, his whole army of fallen angels, all of the principalities and, and powers. Much as we talk about uh, the leader of a nation uh, and in representing what that nation what that nation does. But we are to be, Scripture says, sober. That doesn't mean that you don't partake of alcoholic beverages. It means that you have an objective way of thinking. So we have to learn how to think objectively, and we only learn how to think objectively from God's Word. Because objective thinking is based on reality. Reality is based on truth, and it's God's Word that is truth. So we are to have this kind of mental attitude where we are thinking in terms of reality, and we are thinking objectively. So that is to be our mindset, be vigilant, we are to be watchful, we are to be on guard, because Satan is our adversary, he's our accuser, and through not only the fallen angels, but through the various thought systems that he's promulgated around the world. I mean, we have false religions and false philosophies. We have everything going on today from critical race theory and um, uh, moral relativism to some sort of forms of, uh, of autocratic 
dictatorial government like in, uh, in North Korea and what happens in Islamic countries. All of these different philosophies, political philosophies, economic philosophies, philosophies of life, philosophies related to everything from existentialism to monasticism, all of these are, are just the ways that Satan uh, uses, uh, uses these, these thought systems to distract us from the truth of Scripture, to distract us from the dependence upon God, to dependence upon other systems to somehow provide solution to the problems of, of, of life. So we have the devil on the one hand, uh, that's an external enemy. A second external enemy is the world. Jesus said, I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming. The ruler of this world is Satan. So that the world system, as it's described in Scripture, are those ways of thinking that ultimately go back to a denial of the creator-creature distinction where we are worshiping the creature and the ideas of the creatures and the values of the creature and the systems of the creature uh, to value them over that which the Creator has given us. We've been studying the Creator-Creature distinction in our series on Interlocked on Tuesday nights. And it's vital to understand that because many of the problems that we see around us are problems caused because of a failure to recognize the creator-creature distinction. God is the creator of all things. Scripture says he created all things by the word of his mouth. He spoke and everything came into existence. And as the creator, he has the right and the authority to determine uh, what reality is and to tell us why he created us and how he made us and what he created us for our purpose in life and yet because of the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden the creature wants to determine ultimate truth this is exactly what we saw in the picture of Eve when Satan comes along who had already sinned and fallen by this time and Satan comes and he says, did God say that you can't touch the fruit? And uh, she, she looks at it and she thinks, uh, falls for his trap. He, and she looks at it and says, and it looked good. So she's put, he has suddenly put her in a position to judge the veracity, the truth of God's statement. That puts her in a position over God. She is determining what, whether God is right or wrong. That is putting herself in the place of the creator. And so this is what happens, is that in all these worldly systems, the creature is trying to determine reality and act as if he is the creator. We see this happening today with all of the nonsense about gender confusion is that people think that they can remake who they are. And these are absolutes grounded in the biology that God himself created. So we, uh, we have to recognize that, that we're constantly bombarded with ideas and values and procedures and methodology that are not grounded in the word of God, but they are grounded in creaturely desire to be independent of God. So we have the devil, the world, and then the flesh or the sin nature. That's the enemy within because we ha all have a sin nature. We've inherited that from Adam. And Romans tells us as believers that we have two options. We either live according to the flesh, which is the sin nature, and the result of that is death. Now, this is not spiritual death that is the result of Adam's original sin. This is the fact that we can end up in carnal death, a death-like existence. The Bible uses the word death to describe uh, six or seven different categories of death. You have spiritual death, you have physical death, you have sexual death, you have carnal death. Uh, and when we're in carnal death, we're living apart from God and apart from his word. And so it's a death-like existence. We're living like a spiritually dead unbeliever. And the consequences are the same in our life as in their life in terms of self-induced misery 
and problems and numerous other things. So we can either live according to the flesh, but if by the Spirit we put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. That is, Jesus came and he promised that he did not come like a thief to steal and to destroy, but to give life and to give it abundantly. So if we are walking by the Spirit, abiding in Christ, we are uh, living out the uh, plan that God has for us as believers, then the result is that we will experience that richness and abundance of life. That doesn't mean you're going to be wealthy and healthy. It means that you're going to be able to handle whatever comes your way in this life and that whether God's plan for you is to uh, live in more impoverished circumstances um, you will have richness of joy in your soul because you know that you are rightly related to the Creator God by trusting in Jesus Christ uh, as His Savior. And the fourth thing that uh, we need to remember is that it's not important to know the source of the attack. See, there are some people who say, well, you know, it, you've got to know whether it's a demon or whether it's your sin nature. Most always it's a demon in those, those theological systems. But the Bible never says you have to identify whether the source of temptation is from the, um, from the world, from your sin nature, or from the devil. Because the solution is always the same. And the solution, and we boiled it down to those ten spiritual skills. And the scripture t teaches us that we are not to be conformed or pressed into the mold of the world, but we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, uh, not the renewing of our emotions. That the path to God is through thinking God's thoughts after him, believing, which is an intellectual, not an emotional activity, believing what the scripture has said and trusting in Christ alone for salvation. So we have the basic choice is in salvation, is between the human viewpoint solutions of ritual and works and trying to earn God's favor uh, through the good things that we do, or the divine viewpoint sol solution where in Acts 4.12 says there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. In other words, Scripture it has an exclusive position. There's only one way to God. There are not many paths that lead to God. There's one path, and that is trusting in His Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And afterward, to continue to live according to His Word. The divine viewpoint solution is articulated in Psalm 119.50. This is my comfort in my affliction. For your word has given me life. This is how we grow and mature as believers and experience the life that Christ gave us. On the other hand, we can try to achieve the things we think will make us happy and give us stability and security by doing it on our own apart from God. And that is the work of the sin nature. And Proverbs 14.12 says, There is a way that seems right to man but the end thereof is death. Again, that is not spiritual death. It's not telling you that it's a loss of salvation. It is telling us that we can have a death-like experience. We can destroy ourselves by pursuing uh, the wrong thing and by seeking life where there is no life. Jeremiah 2 Jeremiah is indicting the uh, Israelites for their idolatry. They have failed to follow God. They have followed the uh, false religions of the pagan nations around them. And that is compared by analogy to building uh, uh, cisterns, broken cisterns. A cistern is that which would hold water. You go to Israel you will see these places where they have carved out enormous cisterns in this, into the rock of the, of the mountains. If you go to Matsada, which is the uh, fortress that uh, Herod uh, built down in, near the Dead Sea, that they had, and that's just out in the desert, I mean, talk about parched. There, there's hardly, no, no self-respecting weed would even try to grow there. 
and you get out there and uh, what you n notice is that along the sides of the of the uh, tr these tremendous ravines that go way back up into the hills they carved out like basically gutters along the side of the of the the mountain and that they you know, they could just have you know a tenth of an inch of a ra of rain would fall but it would fall uh, over a broad area and all that drainage would go down and be caught in those gutters and it would be brought all the way down uh, to the lower level where Masada was and then they had carved out cisterns inside of that uh, fortress and they would hold 20, 30, 40,000 gallons of water and that water would run down those, those gutters and run right into the cisterns and they could just have a short rainfall of about a tenth of an inch and they would have enough water uh, to supply 100 people living there for, for uh, several months. And so what uh, Jeremiah is saying is that the people have committed two evils. First of all, they forsook God. They said, I'm going to do it my way, not God's way. And that God is the fountain of living waters. And this is a metaphor that Jesus echoes in his teaching. It's related to the abundant life of the believer. He says, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. See, the choice in the scripture is always twofold. It's either God's way or man's way. And God's way is said to be the only way and that it is the only path to real abundant life. First, we have to be saved, regenerated, born again by trusting in Christ as our Savior. And second, we have to pursue that spiritual growth because when we're born again, we're not born again mature. We're like a baby. That's why Scripture says that we are to I desire the unadulterated milk of the word like a newborn baby because spiritually we're an infant and we have to grow and mature and that comes by uh, taking in the word of God. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth or by means of truth. Well, where do you get truth? Jesus said, thy word is truth. So we have to study God's word. But Israel rejected God's word, rejected the prophets, killed many prophets. And so they are now condemned by uh, Jeremiah, and they will go out under the uh, fifth cycle of discipline as a result of their rejection of God. In 1 Peter 2.11, uh, Peter says to these believers, these Jewish background believers, he says, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. And there he tells us that if you're living according to your sin nature, then you're committing sins that war against your own soul. They're self-destructive. They'll bring self-induced misery into your life. And we have to recognize that the sin nature is our enemy, yet it is the enemy that lives within us. In Hebrews 10.39 the writer of Hebrews says, but we are not among those who shrink back and thus perish, but are among those who have faith and preserve their souls. So you have the sin nature that's the enemy of our soul on the one hand, and you have our walk by the Spirit that leads to a preservation of our soul, uh, Hebrews 10.39. And then in the Old Testament, Moses was addressing the Israelites. This is just before he is going to walk up to the top of Mount Ebal and be taken to he I'm not Mount Ebal, Nebo. Nebo. Walk up to the top of Mount Nebo, and there he is going to be taken to be with the Lord. Deuteronomy 30, 19, he, um, Moses said, I call heaven and earth as witnesses. Now, the scripture says you, have to, you can't convict anybody w w apart from two witnesses. Now, the earth is, is, is just matter. It's not personal. So the earth can't witness anything. There's no mentality there, despite what the pagan earth lovers say. Neither is the universe. 
That's the heavens. It's impersonal. The universe doesn't have anything to do with what you want, to, you like to do or not like to do. So when you hear people say, well, the universe is just really uh, providing a lot for me right now. Well, you just know they're a pagan uh, worshiper of just plain matter. That is pure paganism. But that's not what Moses means. He means by heaven is those who dwell in the heavens. That's the angels. And on earth, he's talking about the, those who live on the earth, humanity, the two sentient creatures that God has made. And so he is calling upon the angels and on humanity as witnesses to the uh, reconfirmation of the Mosaic covenant that God made with, with them. And what he is saying there is that I have set before you a choice. This is the first divine institution, which I'm renaming responsible choice. I think we have to get that emphasis on choice in there. And so uh, he's setting before them choice. You have a choice, life or death, blessing or cursing. Therefore, choose life. And how many people choose the path of death? But the scripture says you have this choice, choose life, then both you and your descendants may live. Now, when we get into our study of Ephesians that we started just a couple of years ago in chapter 4, several years ago looking at the whole book, we see that this is a book that is written, a letter that is written to believers. And it is to tell us some remarkable things about the spiritual life that God has given us. And it's just a remarkable study. And when we come to chapter 4, the second half of the book, remember I said there's, there's three parts. There's the wealth of the believer in chapters 1 through 3. There is the walk of the believer in chapters 4 and 5 down to 6, 9. And then there's the warfare of the believer in the last part, 6, uh, 10 and following. But I just want to walk you through where we, we've been in this because, it, A, we haven't been here in a while, and B, there's so much here. It, it's taken me two years to really teach and go through everything here and, and just to bring out all of its implications uh, for what we as church-age believers are to be doing. And so the uh, shift occurs from chapter 3 to chapter 4 from uh, describing what we have potentially as the wealth of the believer to how we are to live in light of that wealth. And so Paul begins chapter 4 by saying, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And if you remember, I pointed out there that this is very similar to the idea that is reflected in the word vocation. Now, we think of vocation today as simply a job or career that somebody has, but it comes from a Latin word vo verb, vocare, which has to do with a calling. And the idea is that God has called us to something. He has given us gifts and talents, and when we... Uh, are exercising those gifts and talents, that's our vocation, that's our calling. Uh, it used to be, well, it probably still is in the Roman Catholic Church, that if you, were, uh, in, uh, if you were a monk or if you were a nun, uh, you were, uh, that was your vocation. They limited vocation to just a clergy or uh, monastics. But every believer has a calling, according to Paul. And we, that calling is to represent the Lord Jesus Christ and to serve him in our ministry to one another in the body of Christ. That's where chapter 4 is going. And so we're to walk worthy of that calling. We already have it. We're not walking worthy to get it. We already have it, and we are to live up to it. And it is characterized by humility, uh, lowliness, by grace orientation, gentleness, and long-suffering, and putting up with one another in love. You know, God realizes that sometimes we're not real lovable and we have to put up with each other because we're all fallen creatures, we're all sinners, 
And we all do things, say things, and act in ways that, that really bring shame on the cross and shame on ourselves. And God, at the end of the chapter, he freely forgives us, graciously forgives us, uh, every time we confess sin, and it's all based on what Christ did on the cross. So this starts this great chapter endeavoring to maintain, not to get, but to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That unity in the body of Christ is what we have at the instant we're saved. We all have that unity, but we have to maintain it. And the way we don't maintain it is by letting our sin natures uh, take control, and then it creates some problems. And so this is uh, the basic mandate for the chapter. And in order to accomplish that so that we can walk worthy of the calling, that if we skip down to verse 11, we're told that after the ascension, Christ distributed gifts. Verse 11 says, and he himself gave Uh, some to be apostles. And there are four gifts listed here, which I went through. Uh, Apostles and prophets were temporary gifts. This is not Old Testament prophets. If it were, it would be prophets and apostles in chronological order. But this is apostles, New Testament apostles, New Testament prophets. And those were temporary gifts that died out uh, once the church was established in the first century. And then he also gave evangelists, and pastors, pastor teachers. Uh, they are those, those two words combined together. How do you pastor? You pastor or feed the sheep by teaching them. And we went back and we looked at John uh, 20, 21, as Jesus told uh, Peter that his responsibility was to feed the sheep, numerous other passages. That's what a pastor does. And he protects the sheep by teaching them about false doctrine that can easily deceive them. So he, Christ has given us these gifts. Today we have evangelists and uh, pastor teachers. And their job is to do what? To equip the saints. That's y'all. Not some special uh, person who's got some higher spiritual calling. We're all saints. We're all set apart for the service of God. That's what the the root meaning of of saint means. Uh, So pastors, evangelists are to train the the saints. Now, we often think evangelists are the ones who are going to go out and give the gospel to people. But and that may be some of what they do. But what this passage is saying is, no, the primary role of the evangelist is to train the saints to do the work of the ministry, to train all y'all, that's the plural of (laughs) y'all, to train all y'all to be able to effectively present the gospel to unbelievers. And so um, it's for equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry And secondly, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, that's an important word for what we're getting ready to get into at the end of this chapter. Edification has to do with the spiritually building up of the body, their growth in maturing. And so these gifts are given for the purpose of, one, equipping the saints, two, edifying or building up the body of Christ to the ultimate goal till we all come to the unity of the faith. See, today in ecumenicalism in churches around this country, it's not unity of the faith. You have to get rid of all the distinctives so that we can all just put our arms around each other and sing Kumbaya. And you have just just so many congregations who are being infected by the desire to approve of everybody and all of their sins that you have, for example, the United Methodist Church that has given itself over to approving the LGBTQ plus lifestyle and ordaining practicing LGBTQ people. And the result of that is those that are still somewhat biblical in the United Methodist denomination, uh, well over 10,000 congregations have separated themselves from the United Methodist Church. 20% of their churches have left and departed 
from the United Methodist Church over the last, last couple of years uh, over the LGBTQ issue. But it's not just that. That's just part of the evil matrix that's affecting people. You have critical race theory and Marxism and all kinds of other horrible things uh, that are causing massive divisions within churches. So we're to come to the unity of the faith. We are to be unified on the faith. That is what the Scripture teaches us is true. And if you aren't willing to unify on the basis of what the Scripture says, then you are the cause of disunion. So we are, the Christ has given us the gift of, of pa pastors, pastor teachers, and evangelists to equip the saints to edify the body of Christ to the ultimate goal of the unity of the faith and the knowledge about the Son of God. So we have to come to understand what the Bible teaches about Jesus Christ. And I've been doing that in the Philippian study on Thursday nights and as we got to that uh, important passage in Philippians 2. The knowledge of the Son of God to maturity. So we have to understand these things to the goal of, of maturity, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And then he goes on to say that we should no longer be children. There's a lot of Christians who don't want to get out of diapers. They want to stay spiritual infants and rebel against God, but they just say, oh, I'm just glad I'm going to go to heaven. I don't need, it doesn't matter whether I'm in the gutter or whether I'm uh, in an ivory palace. As long as I'm in heaven, it won't make any difference. Well, I think it will. Uh, because we are no longer to be children tossed to and fro and carried with every wind of doctrine. And if you just look at some of these liberal denominations that have rejected the inerrancy and infallibility of Scripture. They've rejected the reality of miracles. They've rejected uh, the doctrine of eternal condemnation in the lake of fire. They've rejected the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ on the cross. They've rejected the virgin birth. They've rejected the fact that Jesus Christ is going to return to this earth physically and bodily and establish his kingdom. They've rejected all of these things. And so uh, now they're just tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, every different teaching that comes along by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But we're to be different. Verse 15 says, but speaking the truth, got the article there. It is a specific body of truth. Our, we live in a culture that rejects the existence of absolute universal truth. We live in a culture that is bought into postmodern relativism, and everybody has their own reality and everybody has their own truth. But S Scripture says there is one truth. Jesus said to the, pray to the Father, thy word is truth. It's, it's in the word of God. It is the word of God. Um, that, and we are to speak the truth in love. Now, uh, remember that, because when we get down to the uh, end of this, this chapter, when we run into passages that are translated, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, it's this verse that starts to set the context for what talking is supposed to be about. So you can't just go to um, Ephesians 4.29 and say, well, corrupt word means this or that or the other thing. You have to understand that in terms of the context. And the context is setting the context of the truth, that what we are to speak is truth, not error, not not evil. So that's where it starts is here in verse 15. Speaking the truth in love that we may grow up, mature in all things into him who is the head Christ, from whom the whole body, according to effective working by which every part, that's every individual believer, every part does it share. But when you have believers in a congregation that are running after all kinds of false things, then they're not fulfilling this. Uh, every joint supplies something according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth for the edifying of itself in love. Again, we have that word edifying, building up, and it is qualified again by the word love. In verse 17, as we get closer to our passage, this I say therefore in testifying the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind. 
See, from 1 through 16, Paul's been talking about the importance of maintaining the unity in the faith and what Christ has provided for us in order to do this. Now he reminds them of what he's talking about, how we are to live our lives. Walking is a metaphor of how we live our lives, and we're not to live our lives like the rest of the Gentiles. There's a contrast between the believer and those who are not believers in Jesus Christ. And then he tells us that what happened is that at salvation, we put off the old man. The old man is our position in Adam. The old man isn't what we were before we were saved. It, it's part of that because what we were before we were saved was our position was in Adam. But we've been changed our identity. We're no longer in Adam. We're now in Christ. That's the new man. And so we have put off concerning our former conduct, the old man, that is the, our position in Adam and thinking uh, like a fallen creature, uh, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, that's the lust of the sin nature, and we are to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. We, our, our thinking has to be renewed. That goes back to Romans 12 too. And that you have already put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. We put on a new team t-shirt. We were in Adam before, now we change teams and we're in Christ. And so now we are to live according to different standards. We put on the new man uh, that was created by God and we are to walk in righteousness and holiness. So in verse 25, our passage, the beginning of our passage. Therefore, having already put off the lie, see, how did we put off the lie when we changed teams? We were in the world. We were in the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of darkness. But when we trusted Christ, we're transferred in the kingdom of his beloved son. We're in a new team. We have a new t-shirt and we have new obligations. And so we put off the lie, and now it says, let each of you speak the truth. Now, in the Greek, it doesn't have the article here, but that has a significance because when a noun doesn't have the article, it doesn't make it indefinite. It puts the emphasis on the quality of that noun. And so here it's the quality of truth. He's emphasizes. So in English, we would translate it with the article. It is the truth, the truth of God. And we're to speak it with our neighbor. Now, when you have the passage in Leviticus 19.18 that says we're to love our neighbor as ourselves, the neighbor is anyone, like in the parable of the Good Samaritan. But in this passage, the neighbor is defined in the next uh, phrase, for we are members of one another. That means we're talking about others in the body of Christ. We are to speak on the basis of the truth, the Word of God, that which is uh, related to the truth of God's Word. goes on to say, um, I mean, it goes back to what I pointed out a minute ago in Ephesians 4.15, uh, speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in, uh, in all things into Him who is the head, Christ. Okay, so the emphasis throughout this passage is go, going back to verse 15 is speaking, speaking the truth of God. And now again, it is that we have put off, um, we have put off the lie and we have put on the truth. And so uh, what does that look like? And so from 425 to 521, there's 27 imperatives plus these imperatival participles, and then we have eight more from 522 down to 69. That's how we are to live. That's what it looks like. And so we talked about the spiritual skills, building this fortress of, of the Word of God that guards and protects our soul. And as we got through the last few weeks, we looked at the final parts of this, our developing our personal love for God the Father, our biblical love for all mankind, as well as Christian love for other believers, our occupation with Christ, and then having the joy or the inner happiness. Now, I moved the box to grace orientation because what we're going to learn about in this paragraph, that which organizes it is grace. That's what this is all about. 
I want to point this out. As a result of putting off the lie, we are to behave a certain way towards one another. Now, let me just go over this passage and point a couple of things out before I close. We're to speak truth with our neighbor. Why? Because that's, it's not loving to, tell, to let them get away with living in a false, falsehood. We have to operate on the realm of truth and reality, not on the basis of fantasy and neuroses. So love is to speak the truth. Let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Now notice that's talking about with other believers. Unbelievers all live in the framework of the lie, so the focus there needs to be the gospel. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath is, a, is the command there. And then when we get to the next command, let him who, let the thief, actually, it's a participle, it should be taken as a noun, let the thief steal no longer, but rather let him labor. And part of the reason that he labors is that he may have something to give the ones who have need. That's grace. That's taking care of those who aren't just being lazy, but who, for whatever reason, don't have what they need. And so you're, we're to work, and part of the reason we work is not just to take care of our own families, but to take care of those who have legitimate needs. Then we get to verse 29. To understand what corrupt word means, we'll see that it's in contrast to edification. We've seen that word at least three times so far in the chapter. To, it, it, understanding what's, what is corrupt, Corrupt is it doesn't build up a person. And then it's further decide, said that what we say should impart grace to the hearers. Again, this is grace orientation. And don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And then we have our next set of commands. The negatives are to, to put away all of these mental attitude sins and the positive is be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Now, this isn't the word for forgiving that you have in 1 John 1, 9 or in a number of other passages, which is a synonym. It's afiemi. This is charizomai. Charis is the Greek word for grace. So this is, emphasizes the grace aspect of forgiving. And so we are to graciously forgive one another, even as God in Christ graciously forgave you. So we've all been recipients of God's grace at the cross, where Jesus died for us, and, and we were obnoxious to God. We were sinners. We were um, walking in rebellion against God, living in rebellion, thinking in rebellion against God, and yet God, who is rich in his mercy, abounding in his mercy, uh, provided a salvation that was not dependent upon who we are, what we do, but was dependent upon who Jesus Christ is and what he did on the cross. So as we come to this next section of these seven, eight, nine verses, what we're going to see is that each one of them, the, you have negatives that aren't exemplifying grace, but the positives emphasize grace. That pulls them all together. They are examples of what it means to live our lives in grace orientation. And so that's the, just the beginning of this section, 11 commands in these verses. And so we'll start there uh, next Sunday morning with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Uh, Father, we are so thankful that we can understand who we are in Christ that this chapter is just so filled with significance for us, that, that Christ has given us a calling, a vocation, a purpose, an orientation. He's provided us leaders in the church who are to teach us and equip us to live up to that calling, and that this calling is then described in various ways, but foundationally it is based on your truth, and it is based on uh, doing that which uh, edifies others uh, in love. Father, uh, challenge us with what we need to do. This, is, this uh, uh, directs 
its, its arrows at each and every one of us in how we think and how we act, how we talk, how we live. And Father, we pray that we might be uh, mindful of how we are to uh, change in these areas in terms of being able to exemplify your grace. Father, we pray for anyone who's here or anyone who's listening online that has never trusted Christ as Savior, that they would come to understand clearly that salvation is not based on what you've done or what you haven't done. It's not based on your personality. It's not based on ritual or church attendance or any other factor. It's based only on what Christ did on the cross and your positive response to that. Jesus died on the cross for everyone's sins. The issue now, are we willing to accept that on our behalf or not? It is based on whether you will believe that it is true or reject it. If you trust in Christ as Savior at that instant, God makes you a new creature in Christ, and he does many remarkable things that are uh, not experiential. They're not experienced. They, you don't feel them. They are all based on your new legal identity as a child of God. So, Father, we pray that you would challenge any unbeliever with the truth of the gospel and the need to trust in Christ as Savior so that they have eternal life. And then also we pray for believers that they might respond to uh, the calling to live up to, to walk according to the calling that you have established for us. And in these things we pray in Christ's name, amen. Let's bow as we close our service in prayer this morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity we've had this morning to sing praises to you, to listen to a message from the absolute truth of your word, and to celebrate uh, the Lord's table this morning. We thank you that you have given us everything we need to worship you and to grow in grace. You've given us our, lo the, our local church. You've given us the absolute truth of your word. You've given us our pastor, the spiritual skills, and many things that we can continue to study your word. And we just pray that you would challenge us to, to want to, to uh, learn your word and to study it and take every opportunity that's available to do so. And we pray these things, Father, in Christ's name. Amen.